Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, and thank you all for sticking it out to the to the bitter end. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to present today is a part of a sort of a new project, um, uh, and this is my first time presenting it, so I'm very interested to see this. But these are themes I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, so, one one thing that might come up is uh, you, there might be a question about what kind of register this uh, 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 work is in. Um, is it sort of hypothetical? Is it meant to be empirical? Uh, so what I'm going to basically be laying out here is, is a mechanism of, of collective wisdom. And with respect to that mechanism, uh, that's very much sort of in a hypothetical mode, which is to say, if the conditions obtain, then it's going to work. But I also am going to include some empirical stuff where I think actually this does obtain uh, also. So anyway, um, what I want to explore is uh, this mechanism of collective wisdom that I think has not been adequately considered in the literature given its really great promise. Uh, and this is the idea of an epistemic division of labor between citizens over issues. Um, on this account, the citizenry is divided into sections or sub-publics, each of which is uh, specialized in some particular issue or issue area. Um, on this account, every section has responsibility for overseeing political developments in this issue area. Um, and through this surveillance, these citizens are going to come to kind of develop um, more well-informed views. They're going to be relatively more informed about the facts having to do with this issue. Um, and they're going to have come to have systematically different and more epistemically reliable preferences, uh, policy preferences, on this issue than the general public. The term I'm going to use for these specialized publics is issue publics. This is a, a, a phrase that's taken from Philip Converse. It's a very longstanding one in the public opinion uh, literature. But that's I'm going to talk about issue public democracy. This is what I'm referring to. Um, so by dividing citizens in this way, what we're going to end up doing is putting them in an epistemically privileged position to, provi to provide relatively informed input to policymakers by way of voting, by way of advocacy, through direct communication, uh, which might be coordinated through a, a variety of specialized groups and organizations in civil society. In this way, every issue comes to have an informed group of citizens who habitually pay attention to it, demand accountability to their own relatively informed views about it, and uh, mobilizing in response to emergent problems that might arise with respect to this issue. Um, in in there are particular in, uh, conditions in which this is going to obtain. I'm going to emphasize that this needs to take place in the context of robust civil society. If you have a robust civil society of free media and competitive elections, uh, the result on every policy is going to be, hypothetically, um, uh, policy that reflects the informed views of those who are most concerned with it. Um, I just want to offer one clarifying point. Um, issue publics are not the same thing as interests. A lot of gonna, what I'm going to say might sound a little bit like um, pluralism in the sign of sort of a Bob Dole kind of uh, line, but they're not the same thing. So um, interests are kind of like monolithic groups that are unified by some kind of interest, often a pecuniary interest. Uh, that's not the case. What issue publics are are arenas of relatively informed contestation. They're kind of like deliberative fora that are issue specific. Uh, and so what you get is disagreement and argument inside this space, but it's going to take place li in a limited space that's limited by a shared stock of information. So you're going to have contrasting policy aims and so forth, but everyone is going, the idea is that all the members of the public are going to be able to spot just a crazy idea with respect to that issue. Okay. Uh, in social choice has the concept of a top set. If you're familiar with the idea of a top set, it's kind of like that. Um, all right, so what I want you, what I'm gonna, uh, in the next couple minutes, hope you walk out with are three things. Uh, three, three questions, and then I'm gonna hopefully uh, provide some answers to these three questions. First, I want you to understand what the mechanism of collective wisdom is that I'm talking about here, and how it gives us an advantage. Uh, that is to say, it gives democracy uh, an epistemic advantage. I want you to understand uh, what the institutional preconditions of this mechanism are, on this account at least. Uh, and third, how it shapes what citizens need to know in order for democracy to perform well. So I'm going to try to provide indirectly answers to all these questions, uh, all these points. So uh, to start with, just uh, to clarify this division of labor thing that I'm talking about. Um,
So the division of labor that I'm interested in, that I'm talking about, has two dimensions. And one is really familiar. It's absolutely sort of bog standard in the literature at this point, which is a kind of a, I call it a vertical division of labor, which is basically functional differentiation between different kinds of roles in a democracy. So you have roles like representative, you have activists, you have journalists, you have citizens, all of whom are sort of functionally interdependent and take uh, their roles in the democratic system are different but complementary. Um, you know, this is important uh, on, the, on my account, but that's not what the primary epistemic mechanism. Um, here I'm going to appeal to, I'm going to call it a sort of a horizontal <laughs> uh, a, a division of labor, where if we use a kind of a spatial metaphor and think of all of the possible issues on the political agenda as occupying some space on a two-dimensional uh, landscape, um, that the division of labor comes in a particular group having responsibility for some particular spot on that space. Um, and the two dimensions of the division of labor are taking place at the same time. So the way, again, to think about the spatial metaphor is that on every one of these little parcels of issue-specific land, there then is a vertical division of labor in the way that I was talking about. So there are activists who are particularly interested in this issue. There are representatives who specialize in this particular issue area. Yes? Um, okay, so how does this kind of issue-based division of labor uh, boost the economic performance of, epistemic performance, not academic performance, of democracy? Uh, the mechanism here is basically specialization. This is not actually too terribly um, uh, 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 mysterious. Um, here we can make uh, analogies with uh, good old Adam Smith's account of the division of labor. Um, in the way that specialization on this account is going to allow individual citizens to develop dexterity, right, this is uh, Smith's term, um, in their particular issue area, right? By um, paying attention to an issue, they're going to become uh, familiar with the coalitions, with the issues, with the facts of the matter with respect to this issue over time, um, which is just going to allow them to develop this kind of uh, dexterity in this particular issue. Um, uh, the, the, they're going to be familiar with the history of the issue, the policy alternatives that have been talked about and discarded, perhaps, um, and, and so forth. Um, and this expertise should allow them to do a better job than others at detecting poor performance or uninformed campaign promises, for instance, uh, in the course of um, ordinary politics. Uh, it's also going to uh, alleviate changeover costs that citizens might have to do when it comes to like a new issue coming onto the agenda, right? Um, if you don't know anything about a new issue, um, but you're expected to sort of follow the new one of the day, you're going to end up uh, basically um, using up the amount of, uh, well, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but basically you're going to be, um, uh, your going to experience some activist fatigue uh, and potentially have your agency sort of fragmented by a constantly changing political agenda. Um, so another important aspect of this me uh, mechanism uh, is what is exactly being used more efficiently in it. For Smith, of course, the division of labor uses the material factors of production more efficiently. On this case, uh, in this case, it's the finite resources of time, attention, and sort of cognitive resources that ordinary citizens have to devote to uh, politics. Uh, of course, as Constant told us long ago, right, we moderns cannot spend all of our time thinking about politics. Um, we don't have slaves anymore, so we have to work for a living. Too bad for us. Um, but more important from an epistemic point of view, of course, is that human rationality and cognitive capacities are bounded are dramatically limited, our ability to, uh, our, our information is limited, our preferences are incomplete, our uh, capacities to process information are limited in all sorts of ways, and uh, for this reason, bounded rationality precludes individuals from optimizing. We can't op make optimal decisions. Um, so all of this is going to end up generating a, an advantage for democracy um, through a fairly straightforward uh, uh, mechanism of a kind of a scalable um, specialization. So any finite group of individuals can try to specialize, but their ability to specialize is going to be limited by their numbers. So I use the example in the paper of the uh, Department of Energy in the United States. 
uh, is in charge of all sorts of uh, basic science research in the United States, and the nuclear arsenal. Uh, so you might have somebody who's very well uh, qualified to do one of those things, such as Nobel Prize winning former secretary Stephen Chu, uh, who has not the first thing, uh, uh, not the first uh, qualification for uh, being head of the nuclear program. Um, so uh, it seems to me that uh, the democratic public is always going to be able to specialize further than any finite group of individuals, and this is a scalable advantage of mass democracy over any smaller group. Um, so the most, I'll oh, talk for 10 minutes, okay. Uh, we go for 15? Uh, 20. 20? Okay, that should be fine. Um, so moving on, uh, one of the most important worries that people might have about this kind of account uh, is whether every issue is going to have its own issue public, right? Some issues are complicated, some are really obscure, some are just not very sexy, like who's going to want to pay attention to those ones? Um, so can we really actually expect there to be an issue public for every issue? Uh, I think by and large we can. And here this is very going to be kind of empirical and historical. Um, and I think if we think a little bit about the way that new issues arise, we can kind of see how this is the case. Um, we can think of at least, I think, three different kinds of cases. Uh, so take, for instance, like a new issue arises on the agenda. So uh, the example I, I use in the paper is, um, Sorry, oftentimes new issues uh, uh, are basically taken up by existing issue publics who recognize that new issue as being basically continuous with their existing concerns. So, um, I don't know what year it was, a few years ago, right, the Keystone XL pipeline comes up for federal approval in the United States. The uh, environmental issue public recognizes this as impacting <coughs> climate change, and so they mobilize to oppose it. Right. This is a new issue, comes on the agenda, taken up by an existing issue public, um, and uh, is, uh, gets its issue public and attention that way. Um, another case we might think of are, you know, we might think that that's sort of <coughs> obvious, okay, but what about issues that lie sort of unnoticed, kind of latent issues? What about these? Um, Ilya Soman objects to issue publics on the grounds that individuals are often ignorant of the connections that might be very kind of invisible between different uh, topics. So he uses the example of social security reform. And he says that the uh, black issue public, people are concerned about the welfare of African Americans in the United, in the United States, um, really ought to care about social security reform because due to lower life expectancy, um, social security acts as a redistributive program from working age black people to ret white retirees. Um, and I think this is surely, it's totally right, I think, that lots of issues uh, have this kind of um, potential. Um, but it seems to me that he, this is where the nature of issue publics as being intrinsically creatures of civil society and the public sphere plays a really important role. So um, people working in this the sort of role differentiated space that I talked about, sort of ver vertical uh, space within an issue public, um, discover new problems and bring them to the attention of people who are invested in them. So here's the role of academics, many, some, some academics anyway, um, and advocacy groups. Uh, so the answer to this concern is essentially uh, deliberation. So what we need to do is um, uh, discuss amongst ourselves. So if someone like Soman, an academic, uh, notices a problem like this, what he ought to do if he's really concerned about it, is contact leaders of the black issue public, maybe try to get um, some kind of uh, uh, media attention to this issue. That's how this process is meant to work, okay? Um, and this emphasizes the importance on this account of um, civil society. Civil society is absolutely an institutional precondition for this to work. You need groups who are paying attention, you need self-organized groups who have taken up particular issues um, to be prepared to mobilize themselves in these kinds of conditions. Um, I have a third example, I'll just let it go. If you're interested in like really big new issues, we can talk about that. Um, so, the importance of civil society for this mechanism, absolutely essential. Uh, something that's not talked about a whole lot in the epistemic democracy literature, the importance of civil society, but I wanna emphasize that for this mechanism. Um, okay, so the last thing that this, uh, last thing, an important thing that this theory provides us that we really don't have uh, enough um, a robust account of 
is a theory of what citizens need to know in order for democracy to perform well. Um, most of you probably know that there's a very big literature in public opinion research in American politics that seems to suggest that ordinary citizens don't know very much about politics. Um, the evidence here comes mainly from these kind of knowledge surveys to ask about factual information about politics, like who controls Congress and how long is the president's term and who's the chief justice of the Supreme Court, those kinds of questions. Um, some authors, uh, most recently, uh, recently and prominently, Aiken and Bartels and Jason Brennan, um, have taken this kind of research to suggest that ordinary citizens don't have the knowledge necessary to be even minimally competent to make epistemic democracy work. So I have a couple of responses to this in this paper, but for the purposes of right now, I just want to emphasize that in order to reach this conclusion, it's actually uh, a lot harder than people seem to think it is. Um, uh, if you want to infer this, uh, the public's incompetence from their ignorance of particular facts, you need some kind of account of necessary information uh, in order to basically leap that gap. And basically, no one provides one of these. I'm attempting to provide a theory that can bridge this gap and explain what kinds of knowledge do individuals need to have in order for democracy to work, at least uh, for this particular mechanism of collective wisdom to operate. Okay. Um, so what is this, uh, what is the account, what, what do Americans need to know? Well, it seems to me that um, there are two parts to what uh, sort of uh, individuals need to know, and it's limited by both dimensions of the epistemic division of labor I described. The first, of course, has to do with functional differentiation. What citizens need to know is, lim is going to be um, conceived of in light of their relationship with representatives, with activists, with journalists, and so forth. And in the presence of these other groups, it's going to reduce the amount that citizens need to know. Okay? Um, if the primary institutional task of citizens is to vote responsibly in competitive elections, um, then the choices on the ballot have generally been limited and filtered through a complex representative process, such that the actual decision that's left to the voters is fairly simple and you might think requires very little information given that it's not a very sophisticated choice. The second dimension of the division of labor further limits the amount that individuals need to know. Um, citizens are only asked to vote for the candidate or party that has the best position on the issue about which they know and care about. Right? That's all they're asked to do. Depending on what that issue is, that task might be really extremely simple. Right? If what you care about is the maintenance of a robust social, well, uh, social safety net, that's a simple choice. Right? If your most important issue is abortion, generally that's a uh, simple choice, at least in the United States. Um, uh, so combining these together, we get the idea that citizens need to have enough information about at least one political issue that they find especially important to guide their assessments of parties and candidates for office. Most notably, what they do not need to have is an all things considered judgment, a political theory of their own, a theory of justice. They don't need any of those things. Um, nor do they even need to do a balancing of trade-offs themselves. Now we might think that this is a problem. Uh, well, whose job is that, you might ask, and that's the job of representatives. Um, so one of the issues with this, you might think, one of, an objection you might have to this account of what citizens need to know um, is it seems like uh, they should know more than that. You might think that there's something objectionable about such a minimal account of what citizens need to know. Um, While well, my account, well, no, and here's why. Um, the most basic reason, so, sorry, let me restate that, make this clear. Um, how, could it be that, how could it be justifiable, epistemically, for people to base their political decisions on single issues? It seems like single issue voters come in for a lot of abuse. How on earth could you ignore all the other issues? That one, that's the one you're picking? That's the one you're hanging your hat on? Right, okay. All right, good. Hopefully I made that a little more. <laughs> um, that objection plausible. Um, lots of people think this, sorry. Okay, um, fine. Um, so the most basic uh, justification for uh, being able to justifiably make decisions on this basis is that, in principle, every political issue has sufficient objective importance to motivate our political actions because of the human lives that it impacts. Right? If a small and obscure public program, for instance, makes the difference in your life, its limited reach doesn't make it any less worth defending. 
Its triviality compared to other political issues does not make political mobilization to protect that program silly or even uh, imprudent. When it's your life and your family, seeming, seemingly small issues might be deadly serious. Um, and so it seems to me that if political issues are made important by the impact they have on the lives of actual individuals, then every issue is objectively important. And if I recognize this importance, regardless of whether I'm personally affected, the issue can, all on its own, legitimately motivate my political actions through a kind of empathetic or altruistic concern about other people's welfare. Um, in sum, in other words, single issues seem to me to be objectively important because they impact someone's life, and the value of that person's life licenses focusing one's political agency on it. So I'm basically going to end there. I have some other stuff if you want to, if you have further questions about myopia, um, uh, the myopia of this concern. Basically, representatives take care of trade offs, making trade offs between things, especially using platforms. Uh, that is to say, the trade offs that representatives make between issues are embodied in platforms, which then uh, some voters can use to make their decisions. But anyway, if we have questions about that, I'm happy to talk about it. But otherwise, I'm done. Thank you. So the discussion for today's paper is Angie Pepper, who is a postdoctoral researcher here at the Centre de Recherche en Thank you. Um, thank you for the paper, Kevin. It was very, very clear, and for that I'm very grateful. Um, and it was also very engaging. And this is an, a new area for me. This is not my field of expertise, so you should, I think, feel free to dismiss some of my comments. Um, it's probably just the source of my own ignorance. Um, my remarks are kind of concentrated on three central points. Um, so the first point I want to consider concerns the constitution of issue publics. You state at the outset that issue publics are a way of dividing democratic labour horizontally, where the division of labour comes in assigning a particular group to a specific issue. Yet in the later discussion you suggest that issue publics are not assigned, but they're rather spontaneous and self-selected. So it would seem that issue publics require no formal mechanism of constitution, since citizens determine for themselves the special issues to which they wish to devote their time and energy. So one thing I'm not so clear about is why, if issue publics are a desirable mechanism of collective wisdom, it is assumed that their constitution must be spontaneous and self-selected. That is, why should the merits of issue publics be left to the contingency of pluralist civil society? You assure us that there will be an issue public for all potential issues on the political agenda, but I'm not wholly convinced by your argument on that point. If people are free to care about what they want, it is far from obvious that they will naturally divide themselves in an equitable fashion according to all of the issues out there. Indeed, it seems likely that certain issues, such as, for example, the protection of animal species that are not particularly charismatic, right? Um, they're not likely to be supported by too few... Uh, they're going to be supported by too few people to constitute an effective issue public. Um, so, furthermore, how are we to understand the structure of issue publics? Are they mere aggregations of individuals who each care about the same issue, or are the bonds between members of issue publics richer and more engaged? Both views seem present in the paper, um, but it's arguably the latter which is better in terms of epistemic merit. So, for example, you suggest that issue publics are arenas for relatively informed contestation and that they can divide the attention of their members to different issues, um, different, different issue areas, and essentially endlessly due to their size, this is a quote, and can thereby reap ep epistemic gains from specialisation at a scale that no individual or small group can match. Now that suggests that the um, epistemic merit of issue publics hinges not only on citizens being divided according to political issues, but that they interact with other citizens who also care about such issues. And if that's right, then pluralism on its own um, and kind of just caring about uh, particular issues is not sufficient for the epistemic benefits <coughs> of issue publics. Um, caring about some issue must be accompanied by a certain degree of political engagement if membership to an issue public is going to genuinely bear epistemic fruit. Mm -hmm. That's what I yes. suspect. And just a quick clarification point. So you mentioned the Keystone Pipeline, and you mentioned in the paper and also in your oral presentation, um, and you suggest that like this was a new political issue that immediately found a home in the environmental issue public. But I also, I, so one thing I'm not sure about, it seems to me that it also has a home in issue publics concerned with the rights of landowners, the rights of indigenous groups, and the interests of the energy sector. So do all of those groups come together to form a keystone pipeline issue public, mm -hmm. or are they part of the various other issue publics that they're part of already? So I guess I'm just a bit confused about yeah. how I'm to conceptualise these different groups. 
Okay, so the second point I want to raise con a concern about is um, your claim that the epistemic division of labour for issued publics can help us to neutralise, quote, the objection that citizens are too ignorant to make good decisions. So in a nutshell, you claim that since citizens often have specialised and not general political knowledge, it should not be surprising that they do uh, not do well in questionnaires about general political facts, um, such as facts about procedure and the role of specific, it, roles, uh, specific political individuals. My main worry here is with the threshold for specialised knowledge. It seems to me, at least, that there is a great deal of difference between caring about an issue and being an expert on an issue. You make some suggestive mm -hmm. remarks about what counts as specialised knowledge um, when you say that we would expect citizens to, quote, be familiar with the basic terms, facts, history, policy alternatives and political coalitions surrounding the, uh, surrounding the issue. And with this in mind, my question is the following. What empirical evidence, evidence do we have to ground such an expectation? Now, you provide some references, and I couldn't, so I tried to, access, I tried to get hold of them, and I couldn't get access to the Gershkov or the Iyengar. Uh, Iyengar, yeah. <laughs> um, but I did read the, or had a quick look at the Holbrook. Now, the Holbrook paper suggests that people are more likely to re retain information about things that they care about, right? So that seemed to be the take-home point. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't show that they will have the kind of specialised knowledge that you suggest. It seems like in order to have the kind of specialised knowledge um, that you suggest, it would depend on the type and the quality of the information that they're exposed to. So it's not just that like we're able to retain information about things that we care about, it's the kind of information that, we're, we, retain, that we retain, which will enable us to have the sorts of specialisation that you suggest that people have if they care about something. So. Um, <coughs> Okay, um, so it's not altogether clear to me that the empirical data shows that issue publics have the epistemic merits that you accord to them. Um, so I'd like to hear a bit more about the evidence that shows that citizen members of issue publics have a sufficient degree of specialisation to be able to identify poor performances of representatives and unrealistic or counterproductive policy proposals. Mm -hmm. Now, you might suggest, as you do in the paper, that the knowledge threshold for being a member of an issue public is actually quite low. Indeed, you argue that citizens need only possess the information necessary to vote for the representative that best represents their chosen issue. But I find this a puzzling move. If the average member of an issue public has no more specialised knowledge of the issue in question than citizens outside of that particular public, then the epistemic value of issue public seems under threat. Again, merely caring about an issue does not secure the epistemic benefits that you detail at the outset. On the other hand, if we raise the threshold for specialisation to a level where issue publics um, are guaranteed to produce epistemically better results, then they are likely to, unlikely to be the mass publics that you envisage. So that is demanding that citizen members of issue publics in fact have a certain level of knowledge and understanding of the issue in question is likely to significantly reduce the size of issue publics and consequently dilute the alleged epistemic, moral and practical benefits. Um, you might respond <laughs> that the specialisation <laughs> inherent to issue publics is not to be located in individual members of issue publics but instead emanates from their collective concern about the issue at hand. Perhaps this is right but I think then we need more evidence of how limited individual knowledge scales up to collective specialisation and the mechanisms which make that possible. Um, just a general observation about all of this stuff. There seems to be a degree of tension between the two types of epistemic benefit that you identify, efficiency on the one hand and epistemically better outcomes. It seems like citizens need considerably less information to get the efficiency stuff, but they need more information to get the epistemically better outcomes that you gesture at. So holding people accountable, being able to spot um, badly designed policies and stuff like that. Okay. So my final comment, and this is brief, and um, it's supposed to be friendly. <laughs> so there's some suggestion in the conclusion of the paper, and you mentioned this at the start, that, about the register of the paper. Um, so there's some um, suggestion in the conclusion of the paper that the exploration of issue pub publics is theoretical, normative, and empirical. However, the normative component of the argument seems somewhat marginalised in the paper, and I wondered if the focus on empirical data detracts somewhat from the strength of the normative argument. So in some sense, when you're defending this idea in terms of its feasibility and its desirability, um, you make yourself hostage to the empirical evidence about how citizens now behave. But if the idea of issue publics is a kind of normative ideal for democratic sy systems because of the moral, practical and epistemic mm. benefits, then it's unclear why it matters what <coughs> we as citizens currently are not very good at, right? Mm. Um, 
it, just because we're not very good at concentrating on single issues or being well informed or dividing the democratic labour equitably between us, um, it seems like it's kind of besides the point. What matters is that we could be good at those things and that organising ourselves into issue puppets would be epistemically valuable. Mm -hmm. If that's right, then the fact that empirical evidence challenges the idea of whether issue publics obtain in an optimal state in existing democratic systems now is not so important. For the challenge to work, I think that people need to show that the empirical evidence um, basically tells us that issue publics cannot exist in principle mm. or that they won't produce the kinds of results that you're suggesting. And that empirical case, I think, is harder to make by merely appealing to citizens' behaviours in uh, citizens' behaviour in the non-ideal conditions that we find ourselves in. Mm. So, with that in mind, I think it might help your paper to see some of the ways that we might facilitate the growth um, and optimal epistemic performance of issue publics, and that I take it would involve an expansion of the normative component of the discussion. Mm. Okay, and that's all I have to say. Great. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely fantastic comments. Thank you so much. Uh, this is exactly the type of um, uh, feedback I was hoping to get first. This very early. Uh, yeah, this is a very, very much a first draft. Sorry. Okay. Um, so uh, just a quick uh, response. I don't want to. I want to hear what you say. I don't want to hear myself. Um, so why leave it to spontaneity? Uh, could we perhaps have too few for an effective? Uh, um, Issue public, uh, that, is, that is like basically a restatement of the objection that I'm trying to sort of uh, uh, talk about. And yeah, you know, it's sort of possible. And I, that, that's uh, why I, I emphasize the important um, precondition of civil society. There needs to be a robust one. If there is a robust one, uh, it can be very small and still be very effective. So there's this wonderful quote from Fenno, uh, who is uh, one of the uh, great con Congress scholars uh, who did an interview with an actual member of Congress who said the following, there isn't one voter in 20,000 who knows my voting record except on that one thing that affects them. And there's a couple of other nice quotes that are to this effect. So that's a very small number of people. The issue public could be very, very small, but members of Congress are extraordinarily sensitive to um, focused feedback on that one particular thing. So uh, it could be small and still be very effective, would be my response to that point. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, the engagement point, very well taken. My dissertation is about this question. <laughs> uh, it didn't quite work out the way I hoped it would, but it's absolutely, you're absolutely right that it's an essential precondition of this. And it's one that, yeah, I should talk about more. Uh, uh, Juliet's paper, I thought, was very good about talking about the social preconditions of epistemic democracy. Uh, engagement is one of them, it seems to me. Um, and this is part of why. Um, how do we divide, yeah, the keystone thing? What about these, what about landowners and potentially indigenous groups and all these? Absolutely right. And this is part of Soman's objection to issue publics. He's like, they're not specific, they're not well specified. Uh, what constitutes an issue public for a given issue? What, how do we divide this? My response to this would begin be to, to basically gesture at deliberation. Um, basically, the, the, the appropriate public is going to be something we argue about, right? Who actually has a say at this? Well, I don't know. Um, we need to talk about it. Um, some of this other stuff. Oh, yeah. So, so I think your this tension point, I think, is really good. Uh, the efficiency and epistemically better benefits. So, you draw a distinction between caring about something and having knowledge of it, and that's totally uh, uh, philosophically rigorous and, and good. Um, I am not good at drawing these kinds of distinctions because I'm like an, more of an empiricist in a way. Um, and basically, I'm I'm hanging my hat on this very very prominent. Um, theory of how citizens learn, that in fact what we care about is what we learn about, that our knowledge of politics is pre precisely follows from what we care about. That might be false, but it's my understanding that it's not false. It is, it is a hostage to, to fate, which is your sort of your last mm -hmm. point, like am I not giving too many hostages uh, to what the, how the facts turn out? And yeah, I, I, I should think more about that. Um, if I want this to be, as I say in the conclusion, more normative, more sort of in a hypothetical register, I probably should back off some of the uh, uh, empirical stuff. I'm not sure I want to go as far as you're suggesting to really kind of like flip it inside out and say, you know, say instead of the burden's on me, the burden's on you to prove that this couldn't happen kind of thing. I wouldn't want to go that far, but I, I take the point. I think it's a good one. Um, so really, really great. Thanks so much. All right, we start with Brianna's question. Um, okay, so I really like this paper. I like the topic a lot. Um, so
So just two quick points. One, um, like if I got this as a reviewer, my first question would be, like you're talking about the division of labor in Adam Smith, but where's Durkheim? Mm -hmm. um, right, so he has a division of labor in society. He has this theory of guild democracy, which is like not too dissimilar to what you're talking about. Um, so that may be something to engage with. The other thing is, um, and this might be helpful, there is an empirical literature on fandom, um, and that's probably in some ways sort of analogous to what you're talking about. Right? So these are people who are like you know, big game or big Game of Thrones fans, or you know, really into Adventure Time, or whatever it is that they're really, really into. Mm -hmm. They are like, in a way, like issue publics. Yes. Right? They collect information, they disseminate it, they um, deliberate very vigorously on Reddit. Um, so, but there is a literature on that, on the connection between engagements and information gathering that may be useful. Awesome, great. Now I'll look that up. Uh, where's Durkheim? Um, he's a functionalist, and I was very worried about functionalism coming out here because I don't want to suggest, I don't want to be too strong with the spontaneity thing, and that, that would be the objection, would be to say that, like, everything's cool if I were to use Durkheim, but I definitely need to uh, address it. Daniel? Yeah, so I, I also really like this paper. So unsurprisingly, given my talk, the, the, the thing that I, and this is really just perhaps a, a request for clarification, um, in the final part, part of the paper, the yeah, episode justification of single issue voting. Uh, you talk about the way in which uh, you know single issue uh, votes are, as it were, like legoed into you know what I refer to as platforms mm -hmm. through the work of the representatives. Yes. But I'm, I'm trying to see how that works. So is the is the is the vision that you have single issue votes, like single mm -hmm. issue kind of referenda, and then representatives take heed of the information that is provided through those single issue votes, and then you know use that as information to. Uh, figure out how to cobble together uh, uh, platforms. You're nodding, so does, does that mean yes? No, sorry, I, I'm nodding yeah. as in I understand. Yeah, that's good. Because if, if if that's the case, then you know there are all these objections on ref to referenda, yeah, right. which which yeah. we've kind of talked about uh, tangentially. Yes. But if it is if, if it isn't the referendum route, then the votes are going to. I'm having trouble to see how the chicken and the egg okay. kind of line up because votes are going to be for representatives who yes. presumably are not single issue representatives, but rather right. people who already have these sort of fully worked out platforms with trade-offs integrated as part of their party's, you know, platform. platform. Exactly, yes. So the way that I imagine this working is essentially uh, through the kind of processes you were talking about in terms of sort of the big tent parties. Right. How do these, th these are coalitions, they are coalitions of, of, of groups and of interest groups. And these interest groups are um, elements of issue publics of different kinds, uh, right? So you do have environmental groups who will be sort of closely affiliated with or providing very close input to uh, the formation of, of party platforms. That's the kind of process I have in mind. Also, you have, you know, political professionals, they, they, they do focus groups, right? In, in the wake of elections, leading up to elections, they go, what kinds of uh, issues resonate with our voters? What kind, you know, this kind of information that is, is uh, uh, accessible using the relatively sophisticated uh, public opinion uh, things and so not just polls, but polls as well as surveys, uh, sorry, polls and surveys, different things. Uh, focus groups, pardon me, um, and, uh, uh, and then also talking with activists. What, what gets activist communities worked? Uh, 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 sorry, activists who are specialists in particular issues. What are they exercised about? What do they want to see happen on the issues that care about them? It's in the negotiations um, that are happening in the creation of platforms that I'm imagining this is happening. Right. So not not through referendums. So so the, the, sorry if I just have a quick comeback. So there's talk in that section of things like seemingly myop myopic votes are aggregated through parties and candidates yeah. constructing. So in, in that case, the word votes in that sentence is probably not quite what you have in mind. Right? right. It's more like seemingly myopic contributions to party platforms, inventions. Or something yes. Like that. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Votes is not is not votes quite not right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I, I always I struggle with like votes and other forms of participation. Right. I mean, kind of like. Yeah, but I mean, there absolutely. could be votes. By the way, there, there could be votes in you know, and there are votes in in party platform conventions very often. Right. So, but you just have to make clear that yes, it, it's not, and, and in which case, I, I uh, this is great. Uh, cool. Risk to my bill, where we are risk to each other. So. <laughs> Thanks Thanks so much. Much. Uh, oh, thank you very much. It's really interesting. And I have a, a similar sort of bibliographical suggestion as a, as as you had, but there can there is a. a, a, a a uh, huge literature on division, division of cognitive labor and division of epistemic labor. One of your colleagues at Columbia 
in a department that I know better, uh, which is the philosophy department, mm -hmm. Philip Kitcher yep. has written uh, at length on the division of cognitive labor and how uh, it uh, can improve, for example, scientific performance and knowledge performance in society. So maybe this is just a suggestion. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm, I'm clear, I mean, I probably, I, I didn't understand, I mean, I'm not clear about the mechanism. Mm, uh, I think you, you replied, and one of my uh, uh, doubt was, uh, was addressed by Daniel's question, but I still have a doubt about the, the, um, uh, the nature of issue publics and the, the way in which you distinguish them from interest groups and, and mm -hmm. novice. I mean, I, I really didn't get to okay, uh, the point, because clearly mm -hmm. you, if I understood well in your discussion with the, uh, uh, and, um, is these people must should be interested. I mean, they are activists, you know, so they, they, yeah. they and so they are not selected for, like in the Iceland uh, experiment right. uh, on the position, yeah. they are not selected, and they mm -hmm. start to think well, they are already active. So how can you be sure that these people are not uh, lobbyists? Are not lobbyists? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the they're they're interested, but not. Yeah, I see. Um, yeah. So well. How can, how can you be thro sure they're not lobbyists? Game of Thrones groups, I mean, there are yeah. giveaway groups and interest uh -huh. groups, and this is very, I mean, in terms of the... Yeah, so if the, if the concern is basically like astroturfing, what, what about sort of uh, artificially mobilized uh, groups? Is that is that the, the kind of concern? It's, it sounds like that's... Um, yeah, I mean, you know, that's, that, that's a problem. I don't have a huge, like... Um, AstroTurf groups are, are, are a genuine concern. Um, now, one of the issues that would arise from this is, do they have a long, st do they have a, 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 can they turn out voters? Uh, this is one thing that matters a lot as to whether representatives take meetings uh, with interest groups. Oh, who are, you, who are you, who are you representing? Oh, I come with a checkbook. Yeah. Okay, fine, uh, I have, uh, there's, money is an issue with this. I have like a little paragraph about this somewhere but I don't have a lot to say about it, because um, it's like, yeah, that's a problem um, for this, sure. Uh, but um, mainly, if you can't turn out voters, if you can't get people to, fo to, to call uh, <coughs> representatives, I'm, I'm thinking about those kinds of mechanisms. An AstroTurf group can't get thousands of people to, to call a, a congressional office over several days. Mass membership groups can do that. So it seems like that's, for me, I'm, like, uh, that's the kind of difference I would want to point to. Um, maybe that's not sufficient. Maybe I'm not. Uh, yeah, I have a question about uh, what an issue is. Mm -hmm. And it's not just important for your, your project. Like, we talk about issues all the time, but depending on what your interests are, there's certain constraints on what you have to mean by it. So it looks like for you, one thing you'd need is for at least to be conceivable that something could be an issue even though nobody cares about it. Mm -hmm. Because you want to be a substantive question whether all the issues will find somebody that cares about them. Mm -hmm. um, so now what is an issue? Let's call those orphaned, orphaned <coughs> issues or orphan issues, okay? Now what are all the issues given that there's no guarantee that anybody cares about them? <coughs> um, I don't know where to start. Maybe something like, well, for every single thing we could do, there's the issue whether we do it or not. And that's infinite. Um, and you surely you don't mean to claim, I mean, I really mean this, you surely you don't mean to claim that every one of those will attract the public. So that's not it. Mm -hmm. So now maybe you don't mean all issues will attract the public. Maybe you mean all important issues. OK, what's an important issue, assuming it could be orphaned? If it's defined so it can't be orphaned, then you think it's true by definition. Mm -hmm. so, so I think you need what's an important issue it's defined in a way that doesn't guarantee that anybody cares about it at all. Now, why well, think that all important issues will attract a public? I'm not saying that's a, a proof that, that it won't happen, but that's yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Important's going to do a lot of like how are we going to feel it important there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Now, yeah, so I, I, I'm I've been treating importance as kind of a black box that like individuals make judgments about these things. And that some people, like maybe everyone would agree that, you know, gum on the sidewalk is just not an issue that's important. See, see that's the danger. That's exactly. So if you let importance be defined by whether people care about it, right, then yeah. you think it becomes true by definition. Right. All, all of the right. issues have terrors. Right. Um, and I guess, so I'm, 
I'm, I'm attempt so when I'm when I'm using that language, I'm attempting to use it in a, in a sense that allows importance to be something that can be more or less true, which is to say it can be it can. Uh, so to to come back to Zev's um, thing about the different weights, yeah. right? We might the, the way to interpret weights on different issues is one way of interpreting it is in terms of importance. So there might actually be a truth of the matter about how important an issue is, and if that's the case, then. I don't think I think that talking about it the way I have been is not problematic because it's, it's not yet problematic. We just want to know okay. what determines whether it's important, given that that's not given that it's I conceivable see. they're orphans. Yeah, absolutely. I, I see. I see. So it's it's not so much defining what an issue is so much as what makes an issue important. Okay, got it. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. So I, I don't have something offhand, but yeah, good 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 question. Andre. So, uh, thank you for the for the paper. It's really nice read. Um, a very quick suggestion on the question of spontaneity and the problem that you address. Uh, you seem to say that it's sort of dependent on <coughs> whoever raises the issue of an issue to sort of gather the issue public around the issue. Um, there is a thing that I started in the 90s which is called citizen science. Uh, and so it's basically the idea of involving, involving lay people into the practice of science. And that can come in different degrees and forms. So it can come from lending the power of your computer to whatever project is happening on, in biology or chemistry or whatever, to more active and substantive involvement in the project. Mm -hmm. And if you go into that, you can see that people are sort of gathering around the craziest projects. Uh, and that's sort of, you know, it's sort of an empirical example that would give plausibility to the fact that spontaneity would not be such a big problem in terms of being able to gather people around even orphanage issues. Okay. Like that. So okay. that might be a way to sort of obliquely address okay. them. Yeah, that, that's good. Like, uh, what, are the, what kinds of dynamics do we observe yeah. in spontaneous? Uh, yeah. So you can compare this in terms of probability of having orphanage issues. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for, for this paper and talk. Um, so, um, I have like a particular uh, issue in mind and I just wanted to get your reflection on the case. Um, so I know something about the Israel lobby in America. Um, and so it presents two weird problems to me. Um, first of all, it's not necessarily, it's hard for me to understand why Israel is important to these voters. Um, there are a lot of other issues that might be more germane to them, that attract people they want. Uh, which party is in office has, in fact, very little to do with US policy towards Israel. Um, but you have these single issue voters that they vote on Israel. But it, it's not clear that there's actually a causal effect there. And then there's a weird thing where the voters, they know a lot about the politics of the region, but it's not clear that they know what uh, the, the actual effect of the executive has or is likely to have on, on policy. So um, a lot of pro-Israel voters this past election voted for Donald Trump, believing him to be the pro-Israel candidate. Um, and he, among the promises he made was that he was to move the Israeli embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which is red meat, uh, for this lobby. And unsurprisingly, um, the, uh, the State Department decided against that move, as every other administration has done since the 70s. So uh, even though that they purport to care about the issue, they seem to lack the uh, information about uh, the role that the office plays with respect to the policies that they purport to care about. Uh, so I just wanted to know if, so on the issue of why they have this interest and whether their passion about the interest gives them access to the, uh, to the right beliefs on the issue. Right. So, two, so there's a couple of things. So one, th this is the kind of concern that I have about um, making sure that, making clear that issue publics are not the same thing as interests. So the Israel lobby is not the Israel issue public, right? The Israel issue public has to include, for instance, Palestinians, right? And, and various kinds of groups that might be interested in, in those types of, uh, in, in that sort of side of the conflict, I suppose. Um, so uh, with respect to, um, So I'm not sure how to answer the rest of the question in that in the light of that. Um, don't some of them not have the correct opinions? Or sorry, do they, they? They seem to know a lot about it. Indeed, they do. 
Um, why did they Why did they go with the Republican Party uh, in in elections? Because the Republican Party consistently takes the most extreme uh, Repub uh, Israel supporting position. That, that's why they do it. Um, it's not irrational and it's not based on bad information. Uh, it's based on the information of the Republican Party. That's what they say every time. They are more extreme in their support of the most extreme claims of, of Israel. If you're, if you're a member of the issue public who is concerned with the, as it were, Israel supporting side, obviously not, not quite right, um, of that issue, then there's nothing wrong uh, with, that, with that vote. Um, now, we might want the other side of that issue public to have more say, and indeed, uh, what, what happens is exactly as you laid out. The State Department goes, oh, we can't only listen to one side of this issue. There is another side to this issue, and these people will lose their minds if we do this particular thing. So that's the other side of the issue public having its, having its effect on policy. So that's, that's how I interpret that example. Is that Hey, yeah, a comment. Just a small, small point. In that case, there are two different kinds of publics. There are the issue publics as you define them, mm -hmm. and then there are the more traditional sort of interest groups as yeah. that defines them. Absolutely. The people who are showing up at the, uh, at the uh, policy convention constituting the Israel lobby sure. are the latter rather than the former, you, right? So it's not going to be the academics who study yeah. Israel and mm -hmm. who know stuff about it or whatever. It's going to be the people who want to incline policy. So, Often, yes. So you've got to have a, a different, slightly different story than the one you told me it's not that the issue public is then going to cleanly transfer into the decision-making fora uh, into the people who are particular are going to be voting uh, on, on the platform. Well, so. this, the, the thing is, is that representatives know that the people who come and the people who call and the people who are who are motivated, they know that they are that they are a fragment of the public. So they have to strike a balance between: can I assuage these people enough to make them go away without? Um, triggering uh, some kind of, you know, basically without offending majoritarian um, preferences on this issue too much. <coughs> so that's, that's again the kind of, the, I, I put a lot on uh, uh, representatives in this account, yeah. but like it's a hard job. I mean, and in some ways what I'm talking about are the kind of day-to-day uh, -day challenges that representatives are, are, are this is just part of their job, right? I, if they were to hear this, I think they'd say, yeah, this is what I do all the time, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this uh, paper and this presentation. It was very interesting. So, um, I just want, I just have one comment and a question. The, the comment is that I, I, your account kind of resonates with um, uh, Philippe Petit's um, own account of a contestatory democracy, I, I think, like with the ombudsman system. And, but so yours is, is um, Add something to it because it's actually more participatory and it, it um, it's a way to think um, of these issue topics as actually um, uh, I don't know giving input and so it's not a reticular process it's also uh, a participatory process so it's it's interesting that so my question is it's it's uh, again uh, around the, the about the the last part of your your argument. Uh, so when you say that citizens are asked to vote on the issue they know about, yeah, so I was wondering, so I understand what you're saying, uh, what you're responding to the but I was wondering if um, citizens are also expected to behave this way uh, when they have to decide whether to uh, elect, to vote for a candidate with a program and whose program is, uh, covers uh, multiple issues. So is it the and here is it enough to know or to be to feel concerned about one issue in particular? It, couldn't you think that it's actually gonna be a bias and, and a problematic one? Mm. So what I had in mind when I, I, I was listening to you is uh, or or the, the or president presidential campaign uh, recently there was one candidate who was very. Um, he just uh, discovered the virtues of uh, vegeta vegetarianism, so he was really, you know, he, he was eating quinoa and stuff, so it was good. If you're if you're really into um, animal rights, you're happy. But the problem, I mean, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> let's rephrase. Okay, so he was vegetarian, but he was also he also said, okay, if the EU doesn't do what we want uh, it to do, we're just going to leave it. So if I'm, uh, I don't know, do you see the problem here? If I'm, if I'm 
on a, if I'm focused on one issue, yeah. I don't know, maybe I'm going to do something terrible for yes. animal rights or for Europe. So. Yes, yes, absolutely, got it. Yes, so um, this is, this is the, the basically the pure objection to single issue voters is that they're myopic and they're going to make, uh, they might end up endorsing the greater evil, all things considered. Um, and I think that that's um, why I, I mobilize this, you know, on the merits, can you, can you argue, and this is, I think this goes back to, to Dave's question about like what is importance? Where does importance come from? Um, I, I offered an argument that like, in principle, every issue is important because it impacts somebody's life. And shake this head. Um, but, uh, you know, with respect to how, I, I'm taking the, the position, the, the, I'm assuming the perspective of a citizen from an individual citizen's perspective, I think any issue can have the objective importance to determine what you should do. Um, and so whether that, and so if you just like don't find the other issues as, are, as important, I think, I know some people who think climate change, think of climate change like this, they would say, I would vote for Joseph Stalin if he would like stop climate change from happening. He'd be like, oh, okay, well, you know, why is that? Because humanity would go extinct otherwise. It's like, okay, well, you know, I, I can see that, you know. Um, but anyway, the, specializing on one issue yeah. introduces a bias here, don't you think? Because you can, you're, you're like obsessed with one issue, and so you're, maybe you should be specialized and also able to balance, to, to say, okay, yeah. every issue is, is important, potentially, <coughs> yes. precisely because every issue is important, it means that Europe yeah. is also important, yeah. so maybe when I vote on a, yes. Multiple issues. Again. Yes, and this is so my so my response to, to this is uh, great, and thank you for clarifying. Um, it's the un introduction of bias at a point that won't affect, on my account, uh, the the functioning of the system as a whole because of the role of representatives. Right, so that voter is going to vote the way that they're going to vote, but they're not formulating policy. Yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> And, oh, sorry, and one thing is that, like, this view is not, I'm sorry, I, I am not committed to saying that all things considered judgments where you're actually doing the trade-offs is, like, not better. It is better. I'm not committed to denying that. I'm saying that it's sufficiently, it, it's sufficient for this epistemic mechanism to get off the ground if you don't have that kind of account. Vision. Uh, yeah, thank you. Just, it has a little to do with the big picture. Um, so yeah, you presented the specialization of public issues as an asset for society, and um, I just want to raise um, an issue, which is the possible two kind of weaknesses of this fragmentation of uh, attention and specializations of the publics. The first one uh, would be the the way the risk of fragmentation of issues could also lead to a lack of attention to the interrelationships between different issues. Mm -hmm. So um, um, a, um, a clear example of that uh, in among uh, environmental issues is the uh, the way biodiversity issues and climate change issues has long been treated as separated issues. So from non-environmentalists, it could be the same thing, but from an environmentalist uh, perspective, it was really different things, different, different issues, different knowledge. And since a couple of years, uh, they, they begin to, uh, to discuss one which uh, one with the other and also to interact in a much more uh, fertile way, I guess, than uh, they did uh, when they were um, tackled separately. So first, do you have uh, some suggestions to avoid the balkanization of issues when it's not appropriate to separate them too strongly and uh, when it's necessary to scale up to overarching issues? That's the first uh, question I have. And another possible weakness of uh, this specialization could be the competition between different public issues uh, regarding uh, their uh, legitimacy to take into account one another issues. For instance, um, so you mentioned the, the, the Dakota, the, the, the Keystone pipeline. And in this context, uh, um, indigenous people and environmentalists have just built a really powerful consensus. 
But we can imagine situation, for instance, in the anti-gay marriage issue, uh, where uh, two totally different kind of, of, of uh, um, um, activist groups uh, have reasons to take the anti-gay -marriage, anti marriage issues, but don't want to do it together. So for instance, the uh, Christian and conservative uh, people have totally uh, uh, took all the room to critique gay marriage. But in the same time, some people were uh, um, advocating against, against marriage in general, against monogamy and against the uh, old privilege of uh, uh, mm -hmm. couples over uh, other arrangements in uh, society and families, etc. And those people just didn't have any chance to provide uh, the necessary knowledge and to feed the public debate with their arguments just because uh, they were competitive, competing with uh, Christian and conservative people on these issues. So my second question is, do you think it's just marginal, marginal and not significant, or is this uh, fragmentation could also lead to, um, you know, like, not the best outcomes because of the appropriation of issues by specialized politics? Uh, yeah, this is a good question. Um, so, the way that I would, the the term that leaps to mind on this question is uh, framing. Uh, sorry, on the second, you should take the second question first. Um, what if an issue gets framed in a way that kind of uh, gives ownership of the issue, as it were, to uh, we might think an objectionable group or in, in a group that obscures certain features of the issue? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I don't. It's. I think it's possible, uh, and it does happen. It's a. It's a defect of deliberation. It seems to me, uh, as much as it is. And, and this account is, in, in many ways, deliberative. I, I sort of obviously. I hope. I hope that came through. Um, and so, yeah, with respect to, to issues of framing, yeah, basically, we've got a hard row to hoe. Um, you know, there. This, in in a way, advocates of sort of a non-monogamous family or, or people who want the state to abolish, you know, marriage licenses, stop issuing marriage licenses. Um, it's a hard, they, they've, they've got a tough argument ahead of them. Um, do they have the best claims? Maybe, actually, uh, in, in, but they need to make the case. And it's not like they can't make the case. That it's not like they don't have access to the press. It's not like they can't write books or, um, or, or try to uh, petition members of, of parliament or, or, or Congress. It's just that like, they're not making headway. There's, there's not, you know, right? I, I, I don't have a solution to that. Um, but as long as they sort of have the opportunity, it, it, you can't, there's the possibility, right? That they, they could be heard. The, the, the strength of their argument could be appreciated. It might not be a good argument, possibly. Anyway, so there's that. The first issue about the fragmentation, that's a great question. I'm not sure, I gotta think about that. Um, is there a way to avoid balkanization, uh, especially you might think in moments of strain and stress uh, when you might have counter, uh, democracy could be potentially threatened. I, I, you know, hypothetically, that could happen. Um, I don't have a good uh, answer to that. Just, can I ask this question? Um, you mentioned climate change and some other group as- Biodiversity. Biodiversity, Biodiversity. okay. Yeah. Yeah, right. Um, and I think, so that's a great example of two issues that were deliberatively came to be seen as one. Uh, they didn't necessarily have that unity before the, the, the issue itself was sort of reshaped through this process that I'm imagining would happen of issues being deliberated publicly. So thank you. It's a great. So we have two more questions, uh, Rich and Arsh. Okay, so yeah, just quickly, because it's going to uh, go back to Juliet's question, um, and I think Daniel's a little bit. But so I want to know why, the, um, why you don't think the normative upshot of your view is just that people should vote only on single issues. Why like the upshot isn't? That people should only vote on, uh, on, on single issues. So like, given that's the benefit, I mean, so obviously then you've got to tell a big complicated story about rearranging the whole system, but there's just an assumption that people are going to vote on everything, even though they're only going to be experts in one respect, but why, does, why would that be? <laughs> I'm sorry, my fault. 
So is it, is it not right that people are going to vote just in the way that they do now, on, in elections for people who have platforms on a multiple, multiple oh, yeah. issues, but they're going to be an expert, we're assuming, in one domain? Oh, So I'm why so give them that vote? I mean, they're not competent. <laughs> I'm sorry, so, so uh, it's my understanding, so this is, this is controversial, but it's my understanding of actual voter behavior that actual voters only care about a small number of issues, and they only vote on the basis of the issues that they care about. As a matter of fact, yeah. and I think the empirical evidence is a little, it's, like I said, this is controversial, but this is my, my reading of what it is. Um, so, so why should we give them a vote on things outside their area of expertise? Yeah, so, and, and my, my response to this is that, um, well, the vote is about a variety of things, but it is in part about the thing that they care about. So they should be able to vote on the thing that they care about and know something about. But then we could just rearrange the system so that everyone gets voted just on the things that they know about. I don't know of any way of doing that. Do I have to be able to flesh out my institutional design? I mean, I think, so. I, yeah, no, I, I think it has to be, yeah, I'm not sure that that's possible. I mean, give me a few months, no? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. No, because you'd have to ex ante specify who, what's important to who. And what the issues are. And then, and then what are you going to ask them, and then they have strategic incentives to misreport what's important. Mm. Yeah. So maybe we should just abandon the project. Another <laughs> option. <laughs> yeah. So my my question or, or comment is also related to Juliette's comment, and uh, maybe it's a way of trying to articulate. Uh, I try and give a couple of ways of trying to articulate what the what the worry might be about this. Um, so one is. Uh, the you know the tyranny of small decision making that sometimes people talk about it when so so like you know I'm trying to plan my life over the next year I think about my life if I think about it what are the things that I like I like hanging around with my kids I like hanging out with my friends I like to go to the cinema say and etc and so if I were to plan the whole year kind of step back I would you know say well maybe five times I'll do this ten times I'll do that and you know on the weekends. Or but then, if you were to ask me any single particular time, what am I? What do I want to do? I said, well, I want to hang out with my kids. I love my kids. You know, everything else is sort of eclipsed by it. So if I were to decide every time on an individual basis, um, then it would end up that actually I would spend every weekend with my kids, which is kind of what you know happens. Um, and then I look back at the year and I go, shoot, you know, I'm like atrophying as a person. This wasn't, this wasn't the right overall scheme. So this is the tyranny of small decision making, right? And uh, so that might be one way of articulating the worry is that when, uh, so let me give a different one, is, and but these all concern, so that, that's one way. And the other way is that on any particular issue, there's going to be interaction with the other issues. So there might be externalities. Um, so one issue, how you decide it, insofar as a <coughs> social society is an interconnected web of issues that interact with each other, however you decide this one is going to interact with the other ones. And so you might worry that if uh, voting for representatives is being driven by concerns with single issues, that there isn't attention to the interactions between the issues, that in fact, right, it's a kind of a version of a collective action problem, that you're going to get these votes for representatives that are driven uh, by <coughs> motivations that are ignoring the externality of the issue that people care about for the other issues. And it's not going to be solved by the fact that there's other people who care about those other issues. Mm -hmm. um, and then so you, what I heard from you was that the answer to dealing with these kinds of problems, whether you think, wanna, think of it in terms of externalities or tyranny of small decision making, is that you have a representative who somehow now is playing the role of me planning you know, my year or is the one who is solving the collective action problem in the case of the externalities. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't see how that's happening, given that the voting mechanism itself that's supposed to be driving the responsiveness, or the story that you were telling Daniel about uh, how it's supposed to occur in interest articulation of the party and so on. These are all suffering from the same, uh, the same issues that we've just described, if what's driving people are single issues. So then I'm not exactly sure how the represent, represent, representation is. I don't know if that's a way of articulating what the, you've obviously thought about, you know, you obviously, you, you know what I mean. So uh, yeah, yeah. Is, is yeah, that more yeah, than anything? So, 
Um, so yeah, um, one of my thoughts about this issue is that, um, uh, and, and I'm, I'm not sure how much this is gonna speak to the, the, the overall concern, but basically the government can do a number of things at the same time. So it's not actually the case that, um, whereas when an individual makes a decision, right, how am I going to spend my uh, weekend? Um, that you can only do one thing at a time. Um, so if my group is like, we have to do something about the environment, and this other group is like, we need to do something about labor uh, relations right now, it's not like the government has to choose one of those two things and then environment always wins, and so labor is always put aside. Uh, no, you, you have some people who do the labor thing and you have some people in the government, you have you know one bureaucracy does that and one bureaucracy does the other thing. Well, the worry, the worry is, say if there's 10 issues, mm -hmm. and the decision that you take about issue number one mm -hmm. has a negative external impact yes. on all of those other nine issues. Mm -hmm. But the impact that this decision has is dis dispersed over those nine issues. Mm -hmm. So nobody in the other issues is going to be uh, considering or being mobilized around the externalities that you're creating because it's dispersed amongst the same groups, so it's actually, you know, but overall, from, like, if you take the, right. so it's bad. Yeah, it's the kind of sugar subsidy uh, uh, case and applying it to the, to the issue public. I'm not sure, I'd have to think about that a little more, because I'm, my, my, my initial thought is that, uh, well, you know, if there is an, a negative sort of externality, the people who are deeply concerned about this are going to notice. But they're um, not deeply concerned about it because it affects them only a little bit. But the point is that it affects everybody a little bit. This is, I mean, I'm well, just giving like you, classic raw, raw world. Yeah, I'm giving you the, the I'm giving you the, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, this is, this is the standard objection against interest group politics. I'm yeah, trying yeah, to give yeah. you that right. version of it for your issue. Right. Uh, issue. Right. Exactly. And, and this is part of why I'm, I'm a little bit. Because uh, I've, I've tried to do a lot of work to, to, to insulate it from that yeah. account, and so I I'm, I'm, I'm guess I'm trying to see whether I've succeeded or not, and maybe I haven't, and, but I'm not seeing it. So the tiny thing on this, there's another thing that could happen, or probably be some of each, there could be this kind of piecemeal chaos, which is, let's call that. Uh, another one is where a lot of people realize, my issue is taxes? I can't possibly say whether we should raise or lower taxes, independent of what else we're going to do, mm -hmm. so I just have nothing to say. And then they'll say, should we increase the defense budget? That's my issue. I don't know whether we should increase the defense budget. I don't know whether we're going to increase. And everybody just shuts up. Um, right? So to the extent that these interact, either they'll do this piecemeal chaos, or they'll be a little more sophisticated and realize, I can't possibly address this as a yeah. single issue. Yeah. I, so I think maybe one part of the answer to this would be, in, in a sense, the way that, well, it, with this concern, anyway, is, yeah. is history, essentially. Events happen, uh, and, we have to re and we have to respond. Uh, and we sort of. Um, we guide our actions using this sort of... Uh, well, if somebody had terms. to say something, then you would just ignore your single issue portfolio. Pardon me? Right? If you're sophisticated and you have to say what to do, right. you, would just have, you would just step outside your single issue portfolio. It's the only sensible way to do it. I'm just not going to tell you whether raise taxes or not. It makes no sense until I, unless I actually advocate a package of things. Well, that's, I guess my, what I'm saying is that in any given moment, you, you, there, there is a package of things on offer. And so you have to then decide. But then I'm not, issue, I'm not a single issue voter. Well, no, you would be. Like, if your concern is taxes and you're like, do you want to vote for the, you know, AC, AHCA, right? Do you want to vote for this new thing? Um, is it going to lower taxes? Yeah. Okay. Then I'll vote for that. You know, that, I feel like that's the modal situation that people are concerned with. They're, they're not concerned to invent. They're not in a situation of static decision making. They're embedded in a history that's moving forward and then they have to guide their decision making given the facts on the ground. All right, thank you, Kevin. Great. Thank you all, thank you all so much. Uh, the system making democracy and the institutional <laughs> design conference. Thank you. <laughs>